Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. More than 2.7 million Ukrainians have fled their home country since Russia invaded. That's according to the United Nations. This is a map you're looking at showing where those Ukrainian refugees are fleeing to. And as many make their escape, there are many others who were not as lucky. The crisis in Ukraine tops our news here at noon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Evrod Kasimi. Just in, the Ukrainian president will deliver a virtual address to members of Congress on Wednesday. In the meantime, a new round of talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials will continue tomorrow after they ended today without a breakthrough. There are hopes that progress can be made in evacuating civilians from besieged cities and getting emergency supplies to areas without enough food, water and medicine. But this all comes as Russia's military forces kept up their punishing campaign to capture Ukraine's capital with fighting and artillery fire in Kyiv suburbs today. This is video of a residential building in Kyiv that was hit by Russian artillery. The U.N. estimates nearly 600 civilians have been killed since Russian forces have attacked. And over the weekend, an American journalist was among those who died. Here's a breakdown of the latest developments. <laughs> Ukrainian officials say that nearly 30 missiles were fired at Ukraine's most famous military base, killing at least 35, injuring more than 100, and shattering a sense of safety in the city of Lviv, which sits just west of the base. There is no safe place in Ukraine right now because uh, you are in war with a country who has missiles who can fly to any capital in uh, European Union. U.S. officials believe the attack was an attempt to cut off supplies for Ukraine. It's no surprise that the Russians are trying to expand the number of targets in this war because they're frustrated. There are fears Russia's military actions could cross into NATO turf, an area the U.S. vows to defend. The administration also threatened severe consequences should Russia deploy chemical weapons. Officials say it's a concern, but declined to publicly discuss the intelligence that suggests it could happen. We haven't seen anything indi that indicates some sort of imminent chemo chemical or biological attack right now, but we're watching this very, very closely. There's also a warning to China and other countries who might try to aid Russia's war efforts. If uh, they think that they can basically bail Russia out, they can give Russia a workaround to the sanctions that we've imposed, uh, they should have another thing coming. <laughs> More aid is coming to Ukraine. The White House is rushing to get an additional $200 million in U.S. military equipment to the front lines. And today, national security and State Department officials will travel to Rome to meet with their Chinese counterparts to discuss Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In the meantime, millions of people continue to flee from their homes to neighboring countries in hopes of staying out of danger. Here's Jay Gray with that part of the story from the Polish-Ukrainian border. Hey there, we continue to see refugees pouring into Poland, coming in waves at this point. We're in the Przemysl train station, and you can see people uh, getting here and trying to figure out exactly where they're going to go. That, that's becoming much more difficult. Over the weekend, mayors in both Warsaw and Krakow, the two largest cities in this country, have said uh, that they have been pushed to their limits as far as uh, taking care of those who want to stay long term. And, and so they're looking for other solutions to all of this. It, it, it's a tough go because you understand many of these families have left a loved one behind to fight. And so uh, they'd like to stay as close to the border as possible in case they need to get back in, in, in case they have the chance to go home or, or some feel like they just won't get the same information if they get too far away. It, it, and again, you understand that the problem is there's just physically nowhere for them to stay. And, and so dealing with that is going to continue to be a, a, a very difficult and growing problem because you've got another round of refugees that are on the way to the border. Uh, we do know over the weekend that in Warsaw, they added uh, 17 new outbound trains, uh, nine of those going to Berlin. Uh, the other eight going to the Czech Republic. So they're trying to disperse as many people as possible. And, and again, that's just going to be something that continues to change and move as this situation remains flexible as well. That's the latest from here along the Poland-Ukraine border. I'm Jay Gray. Back to you now. All right, Jay, thank you. Of course, you'll want to stick with us here at Local 4 and click on Detroit.com for continuing coverage of the war in Ukraine as we get new information into our newsroom. Of course, we're continuing to face the highest gas prices that we've seen in more than a decade. AAA says the drivers are paying an average of 
424 per gallon right now. That's a, a jump of 27 cents last week, and it's a dollar and 43 cents more than this time last year. For a 15, 15 gallon tank, it's costing an average of $63 to fill up. Prices hit a record high on Thursday and then dips slightly. Experts think that they're going to stay high, at least in the short term, as oil prices soar. In the meantime, Governor Whitmer strongly suggests that she will veto a Republican led bill to suspend the state's 27 cent per gallon gas tax. Republicans are expected to pass the legislation in the Senate this week and then sending it to the governor's desk. Now, the reason why the governor is expected to veto the legislation is because Michigan, by law, cannot run a deficit budget. The gas tax cannot be suspended unless an equal amount of spending is also cut for the remainder of the fiscal year. Instead, the governor is calling on Congress to pause the federal 18 cent a gallon gas tax and 24 cent diesel tax. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said on Friday that the Biden administration is considering pausing the federal gas tax. We'll keep you posted on that. Also making headlines at this hour, the massive I-96 flex route project in West Oakland County starting today. And our Kim DiGiulio joins us with a closer look at exactly what's happening there. With spring temperatures on the way, that only means one thing. Those orange barrels are on their way too. This time affecting drivers along I-96. This project is all part of Governor Whitmer's Rebuilding Michigan program. Crews will rebuild east and westbound I-96 from Kent Lake Road to I-275. It's going to be a mess. Why do you say that? Just We have enough problems as it is. There are traffic backups and everything, and then they're going to put it under construction. How are we going to get around? The hope is yes, especially because when completed, this portion of I-96 will have a flex route similar to the one on US-23, available to drivers during peak travel times, which will make things easier on drivers who travel this route every day. This section of highway is most traveled and it's always backed up with traffic jams and stuff. This week, it's the prep work, removing trees and brush from the area. Construction begins next Monday. The tricky part will be the ramp closures. This May, Kent Lake, Wixom, and Milford ramps will all close to and from I-96 for six months. One of the most popular exits there is, too. You know, as a matter of fact, that's the exit we're taking today. The project is expected to cost around $269 million and last three years. I'm Kinda Julio, Local 4. All righty, Kim, thank you for the heads up there. Right now, we want to get a heads up on the forecast as we take a live look outside through our sky cam, our Windsor sky cam at the beautiful Detroit skyline. Let's check in with meteorologist Brandon Rue. He's got a look at what is happening for us right now. Pretty look out there. I mean, it's not ideal, bright sunshine, but it's filtered sun, milky sunshine with some fairly harmless cloud cover. We are warming nicely, warmer than really anything we saw all day yesterday. And you're thinking, well, it snowed yesterday. But then the sun busted out and we got into the mid 40s. Now we're 48. Wind is out of the southwest anywhere from about 5 to 15 miles an hour. So we do have a wind chill. Once the air temp hits 50, wind chill does not become an issue. But we don't have any 50, so it does feel a good 5 degrees cooler with that breeze. Been tracking a little moisture up in the tip of the thumb. That is really it. And that is where it is staying. So we do have a better rain chance for your Tuesday, which we'll highlight in a minute. But in the meantime, as you are heading out and about, the local forecasters app is your greatest weapon and tool for weather here, weather around the world. You can download it or get it quickly. Just hold your camera on your phone right up to that box in the middle of that QR code will sync you link you right to the local forecasters app. It is free. All right, Brandon, thank you. We'll do just that still to come. There are some pretty big pandemic updates that could impact your life. We're going to break that all down for you coming up after the break. Keep it here.